to the opening ceremony of Asia Virtual Academy 2021 Fall Lecture Series. Asia Virtual Academy is brought to you by National University of Kaohsiung from Taiwan, co-hosted by Bicol University in the Philippines, Nolan University in Vietnam, Tanjung Bula University in Indonesia, RIT in India, National Zhongxin University and National Pingdong University in Taiwan. This online event provides a platform for knowledge dissemination and collaboration among partner schools. In the very beginning, I'd like to introduce our distinguished guests today. We are very delighted to invite Dr. Nyet Nok Tui, Head of International Collaboration of Nonline University to give us his welcome remarks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna, for your kind introduction. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure uh, to join with you again today and to welcome you all to the second Asia Virtual Academy organized by National University of Kaohsiung in collaboration with Beacon University in the Philippines, uh, Universitas Tanjung Pura in Indonesia, National University, Bintung University, and National Tungsin University in Taiwan, Raza Rambabu Institute of Technology in, in, in India, and the Nonglam University in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Uh, in this connection, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to National University of Kaohsiung for providing Nonglam University, Ho Chi Minh City, a second opportunity to participate in this lecture series as a partner institution. And I truly appreciate the endless effort to make this event happen again. As you might know, uh, Nong Lam University, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, uh, formerly known as the University of Agriculture and Forestry, were established in 1955 and is the one of the oldest university, and we have a largest campus in Taos and also in the South Vietnam. Uh, from the its agricultural backgrounds, Nong Lam University has now become a comprehensive university, and we currently have uh, about 90 training programs covering wide range of discipline in agriculture science and technology, economics and development. Throughout its almost 66 years history, Nong Lam University, uh, Ho Chi Minh City has been playing uh, an important role in education, attention, dissemination of scientific technologies in Vietnam with its pursuit of academic excellence and commitment to country innovation and creativity, contributing to achieving of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the team for this second Asia Virtual Academy is climate change and global challenge. And there'll be, there will be seven related topic lecture by our excellent professor from seven university for Nong Lam University, Ho Chi Minh City, we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Nguyen Kim Lai, who is the director of our research center for climate change at Nong Lam University, to deliver a uh, lecture on climate change and water resource management. I do hope that all the participants in this Asia Virtual Academy we become actively engaged in the lecture series and discussion. Especially, we will definitely uh, achieve the purpose of this event, which is to share the performing of teaching and studying among participating university, widen cultural student cultural experience, increase the appreciation and understanding as well as enhanced relations among teachers and students. 
In addition, I have a strong belief that this event will strengthen the partnership and provide more opportunities of collaboration among participating universities in the future. Once again, thank you for your participation and I wish you all productive time and wonderful experience while participating in this program. Thank you very much. And next, let me introduce you Dr. Nguyen Kim Loy, Director of Research Center for Climate Change from Nonglam University, and Dr. Huang Ha An, Lecturer of Faculty of Economics from Nonglam University. Thank you for, so much for your attendance and support. Next, let's welcome Dr. Bakhar, SEMC, Dean of Faculty of Economics and Business of Tanjong Bulan University to give us her welcome remarks. Okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Respectfully, President of National University of Kaohsiung, Dr. Yue Tuang Chen. Dean of International Affairs of National University of Kaohsiung, Dr. Sing Hao Wu, respected friend and colleagues from Nong Lam University, Bicol University, RIT India, National Chung Sing University, and National Ping Tung University, and all participants of Asia Virtual Academy 2. Good afternoon from Indonesia. To begin, I'd like to express our gratitude for the second Asia Virtual Academy. This event has provided numerous benefits, particularly for our students in terms of learning from various Asian experts. This program has proven to be long-term and is eagerly anticipated by our university. As a result, we like to express our pride to the National University of Kaohsiung for inviting us to participate in the first and second Asia Virtual Academy. Climate change and global challenge is the theme of the second Asia Virtual Academy. This is an important topic what, that will present us with a challenge in the future. Indonesia is serious about combating climate change. Various policies are being implemented in order to make the transition to a low carbon economy a reality. Indonesia submitted national determined contribution, NDC, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 2016 with the goal of reducing emission by 29 until 41%. Climate change is also addressed in the Midterm Development Plan for the years 2020-2024. Many investors have accepted Global Green Sukuk issue since 2018. This is a way for Indonesia to expand investment space while also achieving reforestation activity. Proceed with chapter in our law on transportation, sanitation, renewable energy, waste management, and other environmentally friendly projects. As part of draft law on general provision of taxation, the government and the parliament Indonesian Parliament are currently discussing a carbon tax. This policy will be a watershed moment in Indonesia history in providing solution for climate change. As part of draft law on general provision of taxation, the government and the Parliament are currently discussing a carbon tax. 
Of course, there are many long-term and sustainable steps that we must take. And the second Asia Virtual Academy even bring together experts from various universities to discuss climate change and the global challenge. And from the university, Dr. Sutan Emir will deliver a talk on green economy and responsible investment. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you for your welcome message. And let me introduce you, Dr. Helma Malini, Head of International Class and International Affairs, Faculty of Economics and Business from University Tanjung Bula. Welcome. Leslie, let's welcome Dr. Yao Ting Zhen, Dean of Office of International Affairs from National Pingdong University to give us his welcome remarks. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the in introduction. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here to uh, meet you all. Uh, due to the time limitation, I think I won't go through all the names of all the uh, distinguished guests from uh, university in Asia. So I think today I, it is because of the pandemic that we couldn't have the opportunity to meet each other face in face. So uh, it's sort of like uh, leaving us into such a condition that we can only have the virtual academy online only. So today I would like to share some of my uh, uh, remarks on the, today's uh, meeting. Internationalization is one of the major issue that we have with in terms of the uh, higher education uh, globally. And with the interna internationalization with the, with, uh, in the higher education that we will be able to link each other together with, uh, with other universities around the globe. I think uh, I'm happy here today that National University of Kaohsiung lately have signed an MOU with the National Pingdong University. And due to the, uh, the MOU signing that we, I'm able to be here to meet all the uh, Asian university. And I think the uh, connection between the Asian university is important in the future collaboration. Uh, I would like to uh, say that the bridging before the Asian uh, university is important in many ways, especially that today that many of the university not only talking about the uh, uh, collaboration in academics, such as the exchange of student and exchange of faculty, but also with the uh, uh, research project, the collaboration in the research project. And I believe that many of the university is currently working hard on some of the important issue by the national uh, United Nations about the SDGs. I know that the University of Kaohsiung have achieved quite a distinguished uh, a milestone in the uh, SDGs, and National Pindong University is also working really hard on this as well. So today, I think it is my great pleasure to be here so that I will be able to uh, share some of the experience of the university with you all. And National Pino University is now uh, working in some of the uh, educational reform that we probably all understand toward the uh, so-called uh, university social responsibility. And the university is working hard in helping the regional uh, com community in so-called uh, revitalization of the region. So uh, if I have some change, I will uh, uh, share some of the experience of the university with you all later. So uh, once again, I am so happy to be here to share with you and to listen to some of the remarks uh, from other uh, distinguished guests from different university. And thank you. And probably later we will have the opportunity to share with each other more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sen, for your great motivational words. 
National Pingtung University is also one of our new partners. Thank you for joining us. Now, let's watch a welcome message given by Dr. Yue Duan Chen, President of National University of Kaohsiung, Dr. Anufo M. Mascalinas, President of Bicol University, and Dr. Sushma S. Gugarni, Director of RIT. Good afternoon to all participants online. Welcome to the Asia Virtual Academy. 2021 for lecture series. This is Principal Edwin Chen speaking from National University of Kaohsiung. I'm delighted to meet our old friends, Vico University in the Philippines, Longnam University in Vietnam, Panjambula University in Indonesia, and the National Zhongxin University. Also, our two new partners, RIT from India, and the National Pindong University in Taiwan will come abroad. In four series, we choose climate change and the global challenges. As the overall themes, global warming has become an animate crisis for us with the ongoing extreme weather events, such as floods and droughts, also increased in frequency. Persisting drought forced streeter water ration in part of Taiwan on February. In July, torrential rain continued to better in Zhengzhou, China, and New York City as well. It has caused widespread damage and taken dozens of human lives. Our friends in Southeast Asia were also subject to the extreme weather challenges, the fight against climate change can be described such our World War III. I'm honored to bring you the keynote speaker of today's lecture, Dr. Xing Hao Wu, Dean from the Office of International Affairs. He's also a professor in law of law, specialized in the field of international law, environmental law and the policy, and the international trade law. I'm sure that he will give you the details and the insightful comments about his speech, moving toward Nigeria carbon society from Taiwan perspective. Once again, I would like to express my deepest appreciation for your attendance and warm support. I wish all the success from the Asia Virtual Academy for lecture series. To our dear partners and students, hello and welcome to the Asia Virtual Academy 2021 Fall Edition. We're still in a pandemic, but that doesn't stop us from offering our expertise and exchanging knowledge across the miles and beyond borders. If there's one thing this pandemic has strengthened in us, it is the sense of one community of belonging in one global village. May this virtual academy be strengthened in you the desire to continue championing the cause for climate change and the many global challenges we're facing as you immerse yourselves into the interesting lecture series. Congratulations for joining this scholarly event. You're definitely in the right academy. Really delighted that NUK has organized this lecture series through Asia Virtual Academy on climate change and global challenges. This topic is really apt because all of us are facing or every country is facing this climate change and there are challenges faced by human beings living over there. I am very sure the discussions, deliberations during this 
lecture series will make all us of all of us aware that we need to be more sensitive to the climate to the ecosystem to the environment which is around us let us all behave in a more responsive way and make this world a habitable world and a sustainable world so that we can transfer it to the generations to come now talking about rit rajaram bapu institute of technology our institute is located in southwest part of india and it is in a state named as maharashtra this region is agriculturally very rich green area and our students come to learn engineering from our rural background so this institute has laurels it is ranked in the band of 200 to 250, 250 institutes top engineering institutes in india by ministry of human resources development government of india and aict other different things which we are doing is we are focusing more on startups entrepreneurship development research then patenting commercialization of products so we train our students or our curriculum is designed in such a way that right from first year they start thinking about becoming entrepreneurs or think of doing something new and creative so the focus in rit is hands on learning experiential learning and learning engineering by doing i'm very sure all the students on this virtual platform would be very very you know uh, curious to know about rajaram bapu institute of technology i urge all of you please go to our website and you can see the details there it's a wonderful place to learn and i wish all the students who are attending the lecture series all the faculty and students all the best hope you will have good deliberations and discussions which you will carry back thank you thank you dr chen dr anufo and dr sushma for their in inspirational message and big support now i'm honored to bring you the keynote speaker dr xing hao wu dean of international affairs and professional and professor in our law school his speech will shed new lights on our way to a net zero carbon society from taiwan perspective i'm sure we will benefit a lot from today's lecture let's welcome dr wu Okay, thank you very much for Anna's introductions. Um, usually, I'm be the moderator of the uh, lecture series, but today I'm also the speaker, so it's kind of a relief for me uh, to have more time for preparations and relax. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, for all the support from our partner universities, uh, from the president, from the dean of the office of international affairs, uh, and from the uh, faculties. Um, I certainly welcome all the old friends and new friends coming to the AVA uh, for series. Um, so I'm going to start <coughs> uh, my lectures. Uh, so I would like to share my slides with you. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, um, so today so my topic would be like moving to a net zero carbon society, and I'm going to speak from the Taiwan's perspective. As you may know, that I always <coughs> also um, <coughs> distribute some information for tomorrow's um, international webinars, and it's also the theme uh, as it moving to a net zero carbon society, um, but not from Taiwan perspective, of course. Uh, it would be other disciplines and from other regions and from other countries so i certainly welcome you if you uh, would like to know more and like to learn more about the net zero uh, information i uh, certainly welcome you and i invite you to come to the webinar tomorrow okay <clears throat> 
Okay, so that will be our my outline for the lectures. First, I would like to give you some of the background information concerning uh, the net, net zero policies and the international trades. And then I will move to the overview of net zero visions in uh, Asia regions. And the next, I would like to focus on the moving uh, to our net zero society in Taiwan. And I will focus on the uh, energy transition field, <clears throat> taking as an example for moving to the net zero targets. And finally, I will give you some of my observation uh, and these themes and the future prospects uh, for Taiwan and how we uh, can work together with our ancient neighbors. <clears throat> okay, so why we talk about the net zero, because in the face of challenges of global climate change, as you may know, the extreme weathers, uh, the disasters, and the temperature rise as well. So the international society finally reached the Paris Agreement. Uh, some of us worry about uh, the legal binding agreements has inspired uh, for the last agreement of Copenhagen. But finally, we agreed uh, with the Paris Agreement in COP21, and we established this um, Paris Accord in December 2015. And for the Paris Agreement's goal is to set the goal of limiting global warming to well below 2. Point, uh, degrees uh, Celsius compared to the pre-industrial revolution level. Uh, but for, me, for more specifically, we have to control the temperature rise uh, below 1.5 uh, degrees Fahrenheit uh, by uh, 21,000. So to achieve that goal, uh, the Paris Agreement also have the financial uh, perspective, the financial mechanisms. Uh, so it, it calls for the member countries to invest on the low carbon investment. And for the resilience goal, of course, that would be Another perspective of climate change would be adaptation issues. Um, so the Paris Agreement also uh, mentioned about the global disaster risk reduction and yeah, resilience uh, for our environment. <clears throat> so as the uh, IPCC is the intergovernment uh, experts um, for the climate signs suggested that all sanitary of the Paris Agreement agreed to limit global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the uh, pre-industrial level. But in order to um, achieve that goal, it's quite challenging. So IPCC called for a net zero greenhouse emission by 2050. As some of you may know that the uh, Paris agreements ask states to uh, submit their national determined uh, contributions uh, <clears throat> and to be reviewed by every every year. But you know, for the NDCS uh, submitted by the, each countries cannot achieve the goal for limiting 1.5 degrees. It's not enough. It's not sufficient. So. Um, we call for more ambition score for net zero greenhouse emissions um, by 2050. <clears throat> so um, in 19, um, 2019, um, another issue arise for the deforestation and degradation uh, of the forest, some like bushfire, wildfires. So that also create uh, enormous challenges for the global environment uh, because they have emit uh, a lot of carbon dioxide for about 30 percent up of the previous decade compared to previous decade. For some of tropical forest emission as well, mainly from Indonesia, were twice about the previous decade due to the uh, climate change, of course, the dry conditions that will promote the peat burning and deforestation. So land or ocean carbon sinks is something we need to reconsider how to protect uh, the soil, to protect the ocean marine environment. For what reason? Because that the marine and the soil and the forest absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. 
So it's about 54% of the total human induced emission. So not just thinking about the reducing the carbon dioxide from industry or from transportation sectors. We need to think in other ways to protect the environment to absorb more of the carbon dioxide emissions. <clears throat> so in early the 2021, 110 signatory parties to the Paris agreements that represent more than 65% of the global carbon dioxide emissions and more than 70% of the world economy had made ambitious commitments to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050. 110 signatory parties. Well, wow, that's a huge lunch numbers. Uh, so from the energy perspective, some of the top inter international energy and climate leaders gather at uh, the International uh, Energy Agency for COP, call for the COP26 that will be held next month for the Net Zero Summit on March 31, 2021. At the summit, they discussed about the implementation strategies and achieving the net zero targets for each country including the people-centric transitions, accelerating the technology, and mobilizing the clean energy investments. So the net zero target is not just a target. Um, uh, and the world leaders has already uh, come together to uh, seek for uh, practical solutions and practical implementation strategies. <clears throat> now what I'd like to talk about what happened in East Asia uh, concerning the issue. Um, from, from the Japan, the Prime Minister uh, Yoshihide Suga declared that Japan will become the carbon neutral by 2015 in January uh, this year. And the Japan initiated the green growth strategies that outlines a roadmap for 14 priority fields ranging from commercial, energy, industrial, and transportation sectors. And this green growth strategy also call for electrical vehicles, hydrogen storage batteries, and carbon capture and reuse technologies. <clears throat> and in Korea, the Korea National Assembly just passed the Bill of Carbon Neutrality Act that requires the government to cut greenhouse gas emission in 2030 by 35% or more from the 2018 levels and the Korean government has adopted the New Deal to serve as a driving force to, eat, to reach the carbon neutrality target by 2050. And this uh, New Deal aims at supporting, uh, the New Green Deal, sorry, aims at supporting the development of innovative climate technologies to expand the use of clean powers, improve energy infancy, and to enhance the carbon sinks. Also in China, the President Xi Jinping committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2060, uh, which was addressed at the UN General Assembly in September this year, uh, 2020. And in December 2020, President Xi addressed at the Climate Ambition Summit, urging that China will reduce carbon intensity per unit of GDP by 65% from 2005 level, and also we increase the share of non-fossil fuel in energy consumption to 25% by 2030. So um, <clears throat> in recent years, a global energy investment um, observed that the renewable energy investment has been higher than coal power, nuclear power generations. OECD and non-OECD country uh, renewable energy generation is estimated to exceed in 2040. So according to a survey, the cost of wind power energy, including offshore and onshore uh, wind power farms, will be lower than the existing coal fire power plants by 2025, the cost. And for the solar power, by 2027, is lower than the coal fire powers. So in the long-term round, the benefits of re using renewable energy development have already emerged and has been proved cost-effective. 
So these are the big three in East Asia. The Japan, Korea, and China has already made their commitments to uh, net zero emission by the, the half of these centuries. So what the Taiwanese have facing is quite challenging. So uh, the president Tsai Ing-wen just announced on April 22nd, 2021, uh, sorry, to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050. So that is a very challenging objective for Taiwan. But to achieve that goal, Taiwanese government is taking a two prolonged approach. First one is to push in for the energy transitions and Second is to reduce greenhouse emissions from the manufacturing, transportation, resident, residential construction, and agricultural sectors. And of course, we have also shown the potential for enhancement of the carbon sinks. So uh, as you may know, I would like to you, you, uh, introduce the Taiwan's carbon dioxide emissions uh, trend. Um, well, Although that's a 2050 chart, but you know, even 2020s is approximately similar. Uh, for the global emission of, of Taiwan alone, it's approximately about 0 0.75, 0 0.75, nearly uh, uh, 1%. But the emission per capita is quite high compared to other countries. So I'd like to introduce you the vision of net zero in Taiwan. Um, we have established the net zero pathway task force um, to de declare the Taiwan's commitment for achieving net zero emission by 2015. And the task force is mainly conducted by the National Development Council to oversee uh, the inter-agency actions. Uh, we have uh, four divisions for this task force. One is the carbonization of energy, energy efficiency and industry division, green transportation, and carbon sink. And the Ministry of Economic Affairs is responsible for the policy initiate for renewable energy development. Okay, so that is the chart, uh, institutional chart for this natural pathway task force, right? four divisions, mainly on technology, industrial energy efficiencies, and decarbonization, and with different uh, ministry to responsible to administrative the initiate. Okay, that's a greenhouse gas we have not just for industrial reductions, but also uh, we promote offset strategies. Okay, um, that we can work with the international partners. Uh, although Taiwan is not a party of UNFCCC, but we can still work with other uh, countries bilaterally and it has to be approved by the European uh, Environment Protection Engines Administration of Taiwan. So these are the driving forces to uh, move into the energy transitions, okay, to reduce air pollutions uh, and uh, in response to the Paris Agreements uh, reduction targets and to um, sustain the energy securities and to implement our non-nuclear homeland policies. So that's why we have to push for the green energy development in Taiwan, at least for driving forces. So why do we, why do we need the renewable energies? I mean, um, if you look at the chart, the stability, from the stability points of view, fossil fuel is quite stable compared to renewable energy, but for the cost, Probably in the, in the short term, the fossil fuel is a small low cost, more lower than renewable energies because you had need to invest for installations. Um, but in the long run, of course, just as I mentioned uh, that in 2027, even solar power, wind power, the cost is lower than coal fire powers. Okay, so even from the economic perspective, that's re reasonable to push for the renewable energies. And of course, that would achieve our low carbon, even the, the uh, carbon neutrality targets uh, by the, the half of a century. So that's what I would do. Uh, so when you look at the, uh, the benefit and advantages, why not renewable energies? 
So now I, I would like to have the brief introduction to the background of the uh, renewable energies uh, in Taiwan. Um, even though Taiwan is not a party of the uh, UNFCC, we still have uh, submit our NDCS, the National Determined Contributions, in September 2015. And, and our uh, target would be the 20% of greenhouse emissions should be reduced by 2030. And in response to the target, Taiwan's Congress had just passed a law for Greenhouse Gas Reduction and Management Act uh, in the same year of July 2015. And the act sets the national greenhouse long-term reduction targets for reducing greenhouse emissions more than 50% uh, compared to 2005 uh, level by 2050. That's our targets. Uh, and we have been written in the law. And the, uh, the overall policy framework for the renewable energy development in Taiwan would be the sustainable energy policy framework. Okay, so um, the sustainable energy policy framework call for uh, the increase of low carbon energies in power generation uh, from 40% to more than 55% in 2025. Of course, that would be quite an ambitious goal. Um, but for now, um, I mean, we have just more than 8% of the overall power generation system. So uh, we would like to, if we'd like to reach uh, the 55% targets in, by 2025, it's quite challenging. So now the, the natural gas power generation increased more than 25% uh, in 2025. That could be served as the uh, intermediate approach uh, for uh, moving to a comprehensive energy transitions. Uh, policy uh, visions. And we also have the energy management law that mandates Ministry of Economic Affairs to propose the guidelines on energy development and it's approved by Executive Yuan. And the recent guidelines on energy developments um, caused that the energy management law required energy policy framework should be reviewed and amended in every five years period. So um, because the law has, is quite difficult to amend it. So uh, the law itself has uh, called for the re, uh, periodical reviews of this energy's uh, policy be, uh, due to the uh, change, the dynamic of international environment. <clears throat> so one of the main things of energy policy framework is to ensure the energy security, diversify energy supply, and to promote low carbon and self-sustained energies. Okay. So now I would like to um, um, introduce the legal framework to the of the promoting renewable energy uh, in Taiwan. Taiwan established laws on promoting the development of renewable energies through the revision of this Greenhouse Gas Reduction and Management Act and of course, we uh, have the Renewable Energy Development Act and also amendments to energy management law uh, since 2009. So these are we call as a three energy law, three big three energy law. Um, the energy management law required uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs to formulate uh, energy development policy framework. And in the 2009 revision, the central governments required to set the energy development and energy supply capacity efficient regulations. And, and the law stipulates that the large scale of energy users who produce steams are abrogated by law to install steam and electricity uh, equipments. And for the greenhouse gas reduction and management and require the government to develop medium and long-term strategies to reduce the fossil fuel dependency. And for the Renewable Energy Development Act, it's a special law that specifically promotes the use of renewable energy. The objective of this act is to encourage the private investment in renewable energy power generation equipments and related industries. And the government plays the role for providing the econo economy incentives, uh, the regulations, and to provide the government subsidies that we will uh, talk about that about feed system. 
So what are the challenges for the renewable energy development in Taiwan? Since President Tsai took the office in 2016, Taiwanese government has adopted the non-nuclear homeland policy um, because of the, uh, as we know, Fukushima's uh, nuclear accidents. So in line with the reorganization of energy structures um, and the uh, announcement of net zero uh, declaration in uh, the President Tai announced in 2017 that the long-term energy structure ratio will be 20% uh, for renewable energy uh, by 2025, 50% of natural gas, and 30% of the coal fires. Okay, um, so, so this is the latest uh, amendments of the law uh, in, tai in Taiwan. The latest uh, amendment of a law would be the electricity law in 2017. The purpose of this amendment is to promote energy transformation, reduce carbon emission, and promote the diversified supply of electric electricity. And also the law uh, implement the policy of this non-nuclear homeland policy, no nuclear power plants. So the law clearly stipulates that all the nuclear power generation equipment should fully stop their operation by 2025. But you know that the uh, the non-nuclear policy has also faced a lot of challenges uh, in, in in Taiwan. So in 2018, the referendum uh, has initiated by the civil society to abolish the provision of this non-nuclear non homeland policy. Um, and the referendum obtained nearly 5.9 million consent votes, passing the thresholds. Uh, so the clause is officially invalidated by the Central Election Commission on December 2, 2018. Accordingly, the three nuclear power plants in Taiwan will have the opportunity to extend their operation period and may even restart the operation of our fourth nuclear power plant because of the result of referendum. So um, the future for using nuclear power for feeding green energy policy is still unclear. But nevertheless, it will not affect the path of our energy transition to green and energies. And at the present, the large scale renewable energy project led by the central government will promote uh, the solar powers, the wind power generation as the main renewable energies uh, by uh, achieving a target of 2025. And these are the incentives just mentioned about a fee in tariff rates. Um, the Ministry of Economic Affairs formulated this FIT, uh, FIT Rate Review Committee to validate the FIT rate. Uh, what are the FIT may will be a, a fixed rate uh, for renewable energy. So it won't be affected uh, by the global markets. Uh, that creates a lot of um, uh, benefits, guarantees for the investors. Uh, in Taiwan, the onshore wind powers, uh, the fit is uh, from 1 to 30 kilowatts capacity would be $7.8 NT dollars per kilowatt. And for onshore would be 2.5. And now for offshore wind power farms, average for 5.5 NT dollars per kilowatts. Uh, and that will be guaranteed for the first 10 years for 6.2 and 4.1 NT dollars for the second 10 years. So it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty high for this fit um, system for Taiwan because compared to EU's average price is 4.73. So that also attracts a lot many uh, investors from Europe from Europe to come into Taiwan for investing uh, the wind farm parts. Okay, so we also have this solar power development in Taiwan. So we have this uh, two-year plan um, and it's expected to reach overall solar general power to 6.5 gigawatts in 2020. Okay, so these are the potential for the uh, solar power. 
Okay, so you can if you can see the installation for solar power and roof type uh, is increasing dramatically. So this is a ground solar power sy systems and rooftop. And one of the picture there is in, in Kaohsiung University. Um, this is and a rooftop of the law school building. And we also have this pond type of the solar uh, powers that could generate the electricity for aquacultures. According to the 4C offshores uh, consultancy's uh, observation, 16 of the world's top 20 offshore wind power farm sites are located in the Taiwan Strait. So offshore wind power development is expected to drive the development or transformation of Taiwan's related industries. 16 of the 20 uh, wind farms uh, is in Taiwan Strait to be proved. So uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs launched the four-year plan for wind power generation since 2017. Um, so this offshore wind power is based on the principle of first to shallow and then for deeper waters. Okay. And first to demonstrations and then see for a potential and then finally designated wind farm block. So here are the uh, most of our we offshore and on-site and onshore wind farms, mostly in the western coast of Taiwan Island. Uh, as I just mentioned, this the uh, the best of the wind farm uh, sites is in located in Taiwan Strait. Okay, so there's a three phrase. Uh, so now we have twenty two offshore wind power potential zones. First, to allocate by selections, and then. Um, proceed to phase two will be allocation by competitive bidding. Um, so that attracts many uh, international investors. And in the phase three will be the auction process that apply the remaining uh, two gigawatt install capacity, capacity for lowest bidders. So the, uh, so far, the Ministry of Economic Affairs has a total of 10 gigawatt offshore install capacity, capacity for allocations. Okay, so what is the uh, prospect for renewable energy development? That is, we, um, as we know, that the local government play a vital roles uh, in Taiwan's energy transitions. So uh, we have this local auto autonomy law that authorized local governments to develop regional renewable energy development projects. Um, and local authorities should establish uh, implementation uh, guidelines uh, procedures, specific implementing strategies. And what's the role for central government is to responsible for providing technical finding, a technical assistance and funding and, um, and subsidies. Um, so through this bottom up model, the proportion of renewable energy is expected to reach 20% in 2025. Um, Okay, so um, we are all facing the difficult times of COVID-19 pandemic. So what is the COVID-19 pandemic result and the relation with the Land Zero Society? As we know that COVID-19 uh, pandemic result of great damages to public health, human lives, uh, and, 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 and economy impacts. But because of the lockdown policy adopted by many countries, especially for some industrial states, has crossed a record drop in carbon emission by 2020. And among, among all of the uh, lockdown policy, the emission from transport account, the largest share of the global decrease. But we can see as a temporary drop down. So what we do is to, you know, this is the chart for uh, the global emissions fall. Um, and you, you can see there is all uh, decreasing minus, uh, even like some of the countries like US, United States is minus 12.9% of the GDP decrease. Uh, and for CO2 emission, it also goes down quickly. Yeah. And what are the prospects for ASEAN members in achieving these natural targets? 
in response to the climate crisis, and we can deal with the climate crisis and we deal with the COVID-19 all together. Um, so what we can do is to initiate, uh, for ASEAN countries, has already initiated the green recovery phase to build up the climate-friendly economies in the post-COVID-19 era. And several programs have already been launched, including the phase out of coal power plants, constructing the electric vehicles and sample factories, and installation of solar power plants. For example, like Indonesia, um, it's, I think it's the only country that submits its national determined contribution to reduce emissions by 29% 20, uh, individually and by 41% with the international help. And it's the only country that considered to set up a net zero emission target by 2017 in the ASEAN states. And the, the Indonesian government is planning to reach production of 600,000 e electrical vehicles and 4.5 million battery powered motorcycles to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions uh, from car will be 2.7 million tons of redu reduction and from motorcycle will be 1.1 million tons by 2030. And in Vietnam has already established more than um, a huge numbers of rooftop solar installation and for the big solar power plant with the capacity of generating uh, 9.3 gigawatts per year. And in Philippines, uh, the, the company, uh, Solar Philippines, uh, plans to install in Batagas, I think it's, Batagas is near uh, Bicol, right? <laughs> Bicol, uh, for the solar power plants. Uh, and it's quite huge. They produce 2,000 megawatts uh, for PV capacity. It's 6,000 megawatts hours for battery energy storage system. And for India, India is considering to declare its roadmap for reaching the net zero, but also like in Indonesia by 2070. So before that, India will have to enhance its national determined contributions. Um, so there are three elements, main elements for the uh, NDCS uh, submitted by India. First is to reduce the emission intensity of GDP by 33% to 35% by 2030 and to achieve about 40 cumulative electric power install capacity from non-fossil fuel-based energy resources uh, with the help of a transfer of technology and low-cost international financing. And, to, um, and also to create additional a carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent to additional uh, forest and tree cover by 2030. So India now has proposed um, the Green India missions, aiming to achieve the, uh, the national determined contribution or even uh, in the future, the net zero targets uh, in 2021. And some of the key proposing programs include the hydrogen energy emissions in 2001 to 2022 uh, for generating hydrogens from green power sources, solar power, and voluntary vehicle scrapping policy to freeze out all and unfit vehicles. And the uh, National Electricity Plan aims to achieve 47% capacity from NASA field source by 2027. India is the world's third largest consumers of electricity and the world's largest, third world largest renewable energy producer. Well, that's, that's quite amazing. 136 gigawatts from uh, from the point of view of total installed energy capacity in 2020. Um, and the solar wind powers compared to new coal and new gas plants has already cost competitive, even without the subsidy from the Indian government. So Indian government has set up its first ministry. It's also um, impressive is India uh, set up the first in the world for the ministry, you know, responsible for non-conventional re energy resources. That would be the Ministry of New and Renewable Energies. So the prospects for ASEAN states, member states, and India would be 
uh, how we work together uh, to achieve the net zero carbon uh, targets um, with the help of international collaborations. So far, there are many international collaboration uh, programs and actions that enhance the carbon sinks in uh, ASEAN member states and shown uh, great potentials for helping global actions moving that targets. Many programs financed by the EU, the World Bank, uh, the government of Korea, Japan are taking place in terms of protecting the natural resources of ecologists, forest, marine ecologies, and to promote sustainable fishery and aquacultures. Then and the establishment of sustainable energy programs. Not just from um, some of the uh, friends from uh, Korea or Japan or some of the international organization. Taiwan is also helping. Taiwan helped to install solar uh, PV grid system in Mars, some of Mars rural areas. So we also would like to transfer the technologies, uh, even the financial assistance for uh, our friends uh, in Asia. <clears throat> So last, I would like to do some suggestions for uh, future legal development. Um, I, I mean, in, in Taiwan, as we know that we have a special law on offshore wind power promotion and development act. Because the, the offshore wind powers uh, has its special um, uh, concerns that deal with the permit issuing, the fit pricing arrangement and in-stock capacity auction. So that needs a very clear uh, legal mandate. Another thing is I just mentioned about the bottom-up approach adopted by Taiwan. So the development of the local regulations to promote the renewable energy is also encouraged to better meet the local needs and environmental concerns. And the collection of special fee for local public interest feedbacks should be well designed and under strict screening from the local council and even the central government. And this renewable portfolio standards uh, should also have its clear legal mandates and even for the market mechanisms for issuing the renewable energy certificate uh, should have its uh, um, amendments from the law Oh, now I will jump to the conclusion. Taiwan has certain industrial advantage in uh, uh, the integration of solar PV life cycle, um, like LED lightning, electric motorbike. Uh, as you may know, that we have a very famous brand is called Gogoro. Gogoro uh, motorbike is a, uh, the market shares for Gogoro is, is, is increasing uh, for the global shares. Uh, so we have these. Uh, uh, motorbike supply chains uh, advantage uh, and even we can have the operations experience for offshore wind powers. So Taiwan is expected to become a potential economy for energy saving, carbon reduction technology, and that could export to other pl places in Asia. And for the existing renewable energy legal framework in Taiwan is relatively comprehensive but requires further refinement and enhancement of coordinations with other related legal and policy framework. And this net zero target requires clear and legal mandates. And we, can, we should have these clear roadmaps and policies in terms of institutional arrangements. So um, the scholars and NGOs urge Taiwanese government to establish a climate change action bill and this bill specifically incorporate net zero emission goal by 2050. And, we, and, then, and the law um, requires to cut down the greenhouse emissions by 50% by 2030. It also provide clear legal mandates and concrete roadmaps for achieving the net zero targets under the national climate change governance framework. And they also call for the support of developing green technology innovation and carbon pricing, carbon tax scheme, and other policy instruments that we uh, discuss uh, in some of the developed countries like European Union uh, and United States. Uh, so if we want to uh, seriously achieve the goal, 
um, we should also consider to establish a comprehensive carbon pricing, uh, carbon uh, greenhouse gas registrations uh, system, and even the carbon tax scheme. Okay, it's also critical to provide financial incentive for business and industry to, uh, for their bottom up approach for meeting the net zero business strategies. For example, there are so many mega industry has already participated this RE100. Uh, RE100s are, are the um, required, is all the supply chains uh, partners to use renewable energy 100%. So Taiwan could work closely to accommodate ASEAN uh, members with these renewable energy certified systems. In the post-COVID-19 era, governments are expected to initiate a large scale of economic relief packages. So we can use these great opportunities to incorporate the green growth concepts in the reco econ economy recovery plans for boosting the renewable energy industry, electrical vehicles, and to provide more incentives for enterprises to embracing the ESG concepts, the environment, sustainability, and governance, and also to create green jobs. Okay, so that would be uh, my presentation, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for your insightful speech. Now we will have a five minutes break from now to 5.15, and then we will proceed to the Q&A section. Please leave your question at the chat box.
Okay, everyone, just got back here, and um, I don't know, <laughs> maybe is is that too difficult for you to understand? Uh, or if, I think it's because of law. I, I, I'm the law guys. I'm lawyer, so uh, I talk too much about law. But I still have two questions um, aligned, and 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 one of the question is. Uh, why law is important to promote renewable energy? Yes, um, I think it's it's quite vital to have uh, a comprehensive legal framework dealing with the renewable energies. Um, as because I don't have much time to describe um, for the wind powers issues in Taiwan. Um, as we as you know that we have um, twenty two potential sites for offshore wind powers, but you know, it, it deal with a lot of uh, other legal issues concerning the marine biology conservations um, and the special, the marine spatial management and even affected the fisheries um, uh, industry. Uh, so because there are so many stakeholders um, in, in terms of renewable development, uh, some people get benefits from renewable energies, but some people, uh, or some uh, interest group, may be affected because of uh, renewable energies. Uh, of course, we 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 deem the renewable energy as environmental friendly, but on the other hand, they also have some in environment impacts. Uh, for offshore or onshore uh, wind powers, we have the noise. <clears throat> noise uh, problems. Um, some of the people complain, especially the neighbors um, next to the uh, the wind farm power, the, the wind power farms. Um, they, they, they become anxieties, nervous, uh, because there's low frequencies noise. Um, and the other thing is a landscaping effect, um, because the, if you see a lot of huge uh, wind powers um, along the coastal sides um, for the landscaping or scenery uh, purposes it have we have some negative impacts um, even for my, my, my migratory birds um, so they will also have some effects to uh, the, the ha habitats for some um, species so once it deal with a lot of uh, legal issues, um, and it, it's it's quite important to have uh, a comprehensive legal framework that could uh, coordinate many ministry institutions um, to have this comprehensive policy uh, making uh, framework um, and to meet uh, many interest groups or um, <clears throat> stakeholders um, uh, necessities. Um, that all requires law uh, to have these uh, specific uh, rules or guidelines or uh, the procedures to follow. Okay, and, and the second question is um, um, is from um, Avius. Uh, Avius, um, since nuclear energy is an environmental friendly option in pursuit of zero carbon emissions. Um, does this undermine its application in the fields of medicine and biotechnology? Okay, I, I would say that um, the nuclear science or um, the tech nuclear technology is quite vital for, for the mankind. As you just mentioned about um, the medicines and biotechnology. Uh, um, but what we know is um, there's also only Serve the experimental and is is a very small scale application of uh, nuclear uh, technologies uh, compared to nuclear power plants and what happened in Fukushima uh, in two thousand and eleven um, and the what happened in in in, uh, in in Ukraine and what happened in uh, three miles <clears throat> nuclear disasters. Um, the radiation is, is large scale disasters if it is uh, breaking out from the power plants. Um, but if it's totally controllable under the, uh, the lab, under the lab, on a very small scale application, I think there's no problem. And, and it's, uh, it serves um, the, the purposes uh, of promoting the main 
mankind lives and the quality of uh, human lives. So I think that would be no problem uh, for keeping the nuclear technologies a move. But it probably could not be a good option for, uh, for energy's purpose. I think that I can answer your question. Um, okay, so is there any? Um, okay, so now we don't, so far we don't have other questions coming up. Um, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, uh, still we have some guests online. Uh, maybe you would like to comment uh, if the audience doesn't have questions. Um, I, I think we. Um, Professor, Professor New. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, is Professor um, yeah. Niam Kim Loy is online? Are you online? Because uh, uh, you are the director of the climate um, studies. Huh? Oh, okay. Oh, so maybe. Uh, oh, Dean Zhen, are you online? <laughs> <laughs> so, would you like to uh, share your uh, observation or even comments about uh, these climate <clears throat> actions uh, in Taiwan, or your view, your comments uh, concerning the issue? You'd like to share with us. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I think just yeah. now we talked about the uh, green energy, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. uh, people mentioned about the nuclear energy. But as a physicist. Uh, Personally, I think that nuclear energy, in some way, if we don't look at the uh, the uh, management of the nuclear waste, waste hmm. I think nuclear energy, in spite of the two major accidents or three major accidents mentioned, I think that it is quite safe in terms of uh, my point of view because uh, the usage of nuclear energy has been there for more than 50 years so far. And especially in Taiwan that we can say, if we take Taiwan as one of the example that uh, since the applications of, the, since the imp implementations of the nuclear plant in Taiwan, it has been more than, I think 45 years or so. So uh, I don't see a, a, a major accident happen here in Taiwan. So from the point of view, it's only a matter of management. It is not the technology. So from the scientific point of view, I would consider nuclear energy something that is safe. But of course, there are a lot of different uh, arguments about the use of the nuclear uh, energy. Especially today, if we look at today's environment and we are looking at the global warming issue and which will be the real uh, solution to that because uh, uh, coal, uh, coal uh, uh, power plant or the gas power plant and so on, they do produce certain amounts of the so-called the uh, greenhouse gases. So that caused the global warming and the nuclear energy actually, it wouldn't create a sort of problem. So it is just a matter of, of choices. What do we want to choose? Especially today when we are looking at the uh, serious uh, climate change in Taiwan or in the world and serious flooding, serious droughts everywhere in the world. And that caused the uh, uh, wildfires in Australia, in Europe, in other areas. So, well, there is also, there is always uh, advantage and disadvantage. It is just only a matter of choices that what we want. So, uh, of, of course, people talk about the green energy. But somehow the green energy has some kind of limitations, 
especially when we are talking about the vast amount of energy needed for the human being, for the industry, for our uh, daily lives and so on. We need something that is solid as the fundamental part of the uh, uh, power usage. So, well, people just have to make some choice uh, to, to decide whether they would like to uh, reject the nuclear plan, nuclear power plan, or they would like to choose the coal plan, because either way, had their own uh, have their own risk. So it's just a matter of choice. So I I cannot say uh, which one is better. But I think from the scientific point of view, personally, I would think a nuclear power plan in some way is is safe and uh, probably. It's better to control the so-called the global warming issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for um, Dean Zhen's uh, comments. The Dean Zhen is a scientist, and I'm a lawyer, <laughs> so uh, it's a very good um, opportunity for us to to proceed for the questions with in different ways. Uh, of course, the technology itself um, is probably relatively safe, but the problem is the management issues. And I will also say that could be the site, siting uh, issue. If it is in the wrong place, that will create problems. And because of the uh, immediate dangers of climate change, we don't know which place or which sites would be more suitable and more safe uh, for establishing or installing, installed uh, nuclear plants. So that creates more complexities uh, for the nuclear power plants. Okay, thank you very much for um, uh, on Dean Zen's comments. And I have, I think we have more, one more questions coming up. Um, it's from Catherine. Uh, what would possibly happen to industry with carbon emissions if majority converted to renewable energy? Would their products go to waste, creating another possible form of pollution? Okay. Um, uh, I think is uh, I, I thank you very much for your questions, and I, I think there's a, um, I would say that it's kind of like a risk trade risk trade off uh, issues that I was I would say that's um, it, it must have some pollutions uh, for producing from renewable sources. Uh, just I mentioned to you about the solar power, the solar power if it is, it could be it could be used for for rooftop is about. 10 to 15 years, what happened to, well, once the exploration date has come, it has to become the waste. Um, so you need to recycle uh, the solar, uh, the power paddles. Um, that creates some problems with pollutions. Um, and some scientists, engineers are thinking about how to, uh, to recycle it in more environmental friendly fashion. So um, probably now it won't be a very serious problem for dealing with the waste of the solar uh, power paddles. Um, but what, what for the wind powers? Yeah, that creates problems. I, I think it's, it's quite huge and um, it has some problem with the noise, just I mentioned to you. Um, but compared to coal fire power and to its uh, negative impacts to the environment, and to worsen the climate change. That's a risk trade-off issues that we prop, everything we have is risk. Just like uh, Dean just mentioned about nuclear power, that's a choice. That is a is an issue of choices. Uh, but we, we should proceed to what is the most immediate dangers and with the lower risk and a lower cost uh, option we have. Just I mentioned to you that um, in the past, people think that coal fire uh, power is stable and it's cost uh, is less cost. But um, many of example, especially in India, uh, has already shown us that it's more cost effective for adopting the renewable energies um, than the co the new coal fire plants or uh, the gas uh, power plants. Uh, so from an economic perspective, or even from an environmental perspective, I think the industry would, uh, would, would make good choices for converting to renewable energy. And then because of a law, 
require. Um, and, and why the law should require industry to convert to renewable energies is they are achieving, they're trying to achieve uh, the uh, carbon neutrality targets uh, by 2050, 2070s. Um, so I would say that, of course, they, may, they probably have some pollutions, but you know, compared to uh, the coal fires, uh, compared to fossil fuel combustions, I think it's still a better choice for the mankind and for the future generations. Okay, um, any other? Okay, um, we have one more question. So I think I will answer this uh, last question because of the time limits. Uh, it's from Jojo. Uh, with the emergency of serious and widespread power crisis um, in countries all over the world, how can we able to achieve and meet the net zero goals uh, without compromising our need and demand? For energy and electricity. Okay, so that's a very big question, and, and that's all about my presentation. Uh, okay, I think I'm all, all of my presentation is, is I think it's answering your questions: how we achieve the net zero goals without compromising our demand and need. Um, yeah, I, I think probably um, what we can know that it, because of a COVID nineteen pandemic, that's, that creates opportunity for us to rethink. Uh, about the, the, our climate actions. Uh, is that enough and or is it sufficient? Because we, uh, we we're focusing on the uh, pandemic control for the past two years. Um, and we also witnessed that without human activities, without decreasing the frequency and, and of human activity, especially for traveling, has dramatically, dramatically dropped down the carbon dioxide emissions in many countries. Uh, and, 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 and you know, only one, only for one year, uh, you can see many uh, animals and, and, and even some endangered species show up in the urban areas. You know, uh, even you can see uh, the dolphins, um, the swimming uh, in, in, in uh, Venice, uh, Italy. Uh, so because of a lockdown, so what, what is the, the major pollutions uh, in the world? What is the the most endangered uh, to the world, um, to the to the earth, would be the man, the human. We, we, it can, you can, it's, it's, it's evident that if you're reducing the human activities, the carbon dioxide would would drop down dramatically. So uh, we're we're still on a turning point. We still have time and opportunities to um, to convert these trends of global tr warming. Um, I think many of you know that the scientist is quite, um, quite. I, I would say that it is that uh, optimistic uh, for uh, for turning back the, the global uh, climate uh, trends, um, and and we are facing the uh, the global crisis even by two thousand sixty or two thousand fifty. Um, but you can see that even for one or two year decreasing of human activities, we can achieve that goal. So um, I don't think it's not that it's not difficult or impossible to achieve net zero goals. But what is important is the political will and the determinations of, of people. Okay, so uh, even though we have a, a variety of various policy instruments technology in hands. But if we lack of political wills and our determination, uh, especially for the future generation like you, uh, the new, uh, the young, the youngest, uh, the youngsters, so it won't happen. I mean, just like uh, uh, there are so many uh, campaigns going on for the youth, uh, for climate actions, I think you can do something different. You can do have something different because we, uh, you are saving your futures. You're saving the earth. You're saving your own futures. So I think even uh, there are so many um, arguments and and, and so uh, skepticism 
about meeting the net zero goals, but we, we have to, uh, to take the first step. If you don't take the first step, it won't happen. Just like what happened in the past 20, 20 years for our international negotiation of climate change. People just keep saying, talking, and we don't take serious actions uh, in terms of uh, 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 reducing the fossil fuel combustions. We'll, so we are not going anywhere. So COVID-19 have just uh, give us opportunity, opportunity for us to rethink if we want to, uh, to have these huge uh, economy recovery plans, why it should not be the Green Deal or Green Growth initiatives and to create more green jobs uh, for uh, compensating uh, one, for uh, people who are losing their jobs because of the, the pandemic. Okay. Um, so I think that would be the, my answer. I'm, 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 I'm not sure whether I answer your questions, uh, but I do appreciate for your questions. I do appreciate for uh, our guests uh, coming to um, uh, still with us in online. So maybe um, Dr. Hama, <laughs> Dr. Hama, if you'd like to give us some more uh, your thoughts and comments. Yeah. Of course, because of you're course. Economist, I would like to, to know more. Yeah. About yeah. So actually, the point of view of uh, economists uh, in Indonesia, I will take uh, my perspective into Indonesia perspective. Uh, in combating uh, climate change, it is not compulsory still in Indonesia. We are ha uh, having the regulation still uh, voluntarily. For example, uh, corporation in Indonesia still able to uh, loan money into banking, although they don't have a corporate social responsibility uh, report in their uh, financial uh, report. So it is okay uh, for them. But uh, in the next uh, three years, government going to make it uh, compulsory because uh, they knew they have a determined and then make it into their commitment. So in the next three years, we will find a new regulation that uh, insisting and forcing uh, corporation in Indonesia to have uh, all the allocation in terms of CSR and then sustainability and then good corporate governance as a way of uh, their contrib contribution into the climate change. But uh, in uh, especially when I see the Indonesia uh, landscape toward the climate change, more or less uh, there is a huge contribution of how corporations see uh, the climate change itself. So in a way, they are more into their good corporate governance and then the effort uh, to become more sustainable in the future. I think that is my point of view when we are uh, uh, talking climate change in Indonesia, Dinu. Uh, okay, thank you very much for Dr. Helmer's uh, insightful comments, especially uh, for the policies and business trend in Indonesia. So finally, maybe I would like to invite uh, Dean Tree, uh, still online with us. I'd like to, because Dean Tree is also uh, the expert in uh, water resource management, so it'll be uh, more related to the climate crisis. So I would like to hear uh, Dr. Dean's, uh, Dean Tree for your comments and thoughts. Okay. okay, thank you very much, uh, Ding Wu, for yeah. your very comprehensive reviews of, uh, you know, our country in the Asia and Asian country moving toward the net zero uh, carbon uh, society. And uh, I think Vietnam also take uh, all very uh, aggressively as action to uh, do that. And But I got one question or one comment from the student about the do we create another problems, uh, uh, you know, in uh, when we respond to that uh, the, the, the the issue? Like in Vietnam, as my experience, that uh, you see, there are so many uh, the the installation of the solar power panels, and that uh, I, I I keep thinking where the panel going after the use of uh, uh, you know when after 10, 15 years. And uh, that uh, is that a, a solution for the future? Um, 
and uh, also for the the, the re, uh, for the nuclear power plants we have uh, in the past uh, i think about 5 10 you have big uh, plan master plan to uh, for the uh, nuclear power plant in the coastal uh, region of vietnam but you know um, i think uh, the last administration after considering the you know the, the risk of uh, a nuclear power so the project uh, support to be uh, funded or uh, invested by investor uh, by the uh, Russian government has uh, suspended. So it's uh, it's no longer in in in, in the, the the government uh, uh, plans. So you know, um, I think it's already <laughs> late for for this. So my um, I think that I hope that we can go back to this issue some days and uh, discuss about this. Uh, but uh, that uh, really, uh, I think, very, very uh, good and uh, issue that uh, we, 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 we need to revisit uh, in the future. And again, thank you very much, Ting Wu, for your very comprehensive reviews of uh, how government around, uh, you know, in the region combats with, uh, you know, uh, moving toward the, the, the next zero carbon. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, I think we almost about past a lot sometimes, and I do appreciate for all audience with us. Um, so perhaps we, we, we have to read up this uh, discussion and we will have the uh, uh, have our speakers from uh, Bicol, Bicol University next week, right? Uh, okay, yeah, I appreciate that. So. Um, I think I will just read out this uh, this uh, opening sessions, and I appreciate it for all your support and with us and all the audience for your wonderful questions. And if you have other questions, I I, I certainly welcome you to join our uh, webinar tomorrow. Um, and I think we have we have already sent uh, the YouTube link to to our partner university, so you are welcome almost welcome to join us and, and to hear more experts around the world to talk about the issue. Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much uh, for all your supporting. I will see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.